another show. Let's go on with our show. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a little bit about Brazos County history and bring you up to date, and then we'll talk a little bit about philanthropy, and then we'll all go home, take off our shoes, and have a nap. <laughs> In the beginning, there was dirt, lots and lots of dirt. Folks who supposedly know tell us that 12,000 years ago, some form of human life walked around Brazos County. Now we're going fast forward. We're not going through all those 12,000 years, thank God. <laughs> 1821 was a very pivotal year. It's the year that the Mexicans told the Spaniards to get the hell out of Mexico and go back to Spain. And they did that, and Mexico won its independence. If people in the United States wanted to come to Texas, they had to apply for an entry certificate. They applied to the government of Spain, and then after 1821, they applied to the Mexican government. A man whom you all have heard of, Moses Austin, was a, a Missouri resident, and he was an entrepreneur, sometimes called an impresario, and he wanted to bring 300 families to Texas. He traveled from Missouri by horseback to San Antonio and on to Mexico City. Now, you, I, I can't do that trip with an airplane because I'm old and tired, but just think about going on a horse. But he was working with this and trying to get around with all these regulations, and he died, and his son, Stephen F. Austin, took over and brought, brought all these folks down here. Now, in 1826, there were Indian uprisings in this part of Texas, and they, they didn't come to, to say hello to you and, and grab the livestock and, and, and uh, uh, what? They scout people. It was a horrible thing. There were four boys named Henry who were born in Ireland, and they, three of them came to the United States and landed at Charleston, the other one came over later, and they stayed there a few years. They went to Alabama, and finally, those four boys got to South Robertson County and North Brazos County. And just like the Bible says, they went forth and multiplied. <clears throat> In 1831, you know, let's go back, let's go back to 21. Okay, we'll go back to 18, 1821. The first Anglo people who came to Brazos County were named Millican. I'm glad I don't have a heart monitor on. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you look at this old map of Brazos County, down at the bottom, you'll see about seven different areas called leagues or surveys or whatever you want to call it. They were geographic entities, and they're all named Millican. Now, there's one little bitty one up here named Millican. But the Millican family was quite large, and, and they obviously the town was named for them later on. <laughs> As I told you, the Indians were raising hell with people around here. And in 1833, Robert Henry's wife, Betty, took her four children, two ponies, and a pack horse and forded the Navasota River about where Highway 21 goes across there. She was going to the fort in Nacogdoches for safety. And she swam back and forth, taking each child and each horse and finally got across. She had a wagon up to that point and she left the wagon there. And the remarkable thing, among many things, when she came back a long, long time later, the wagon was still there. Her husband went off to fight the Indians. They were sort of a, a precursor of the Texas Rangers. And she took those children to the Fort Nacogdoches. She left home without her American Express card. They took her in and took good care of her. And she came back after the thing was over. Now, we all know what happened in 1836. Texas won its independence from Mexico. The folks in Austin in 1837 and this was not the state of Texas, this was the Republic of Texas, gave some borders to Washington County. And we know Washington County today, but this Washington County was immense in size. And they had trouble when they, part of Brazos County as we know it today was part of Washington County. And they had trouble getting folks across the Brazos River if they wanted to go vote or serve on a jury or whatnot. So they divided it and they called, we called our county Navasota County in 1841. And then the next year, 
they said, well, we're going to call it Brazos County. So Brazos County really started officially in 1842. In 1841, there were more horses in Brazos County than there were men over the age of 21. It was sparsely populated. They had a terrible time trying to get six qualified people to serve on a jury. Qualified means that you own real estate, and a lot of folks didn't own real estate. Now we go, we'll backpedal a little bit and go back to 1831. The Millikens were the first family down here, and then up in here, the Carter, Richard Carter family came in October of 1831. And his daughter, years later, said it was until July of the next year before she saw a woman other than an Indian woman. They were isolated. And their number one job was to survive. And they survived on wild game and honey. It was a very restricted menu, but they made it. When Richard Carter came, he was given a grant of, I believe it was 4,428 acres of land. And that's a bunch of land. He didn't hold on to all of it, but he did do that. He moved up north to Tenenville, which of course is evaporated a long time ago. And when he was in Tenenville, Harvey Mitchell came up there and lived with him a couple of years and taught school in the Richard Carter house. Now today you can ride down Carter Creek Parkway in Bryan, you know where Carter Creek is. You can come out to College Station and you can see the, the monument and the Carter Park. So Richard Carter was, was quite, quite prominent in the good old days. In 1850, there were 466 people who lived in Brazos County, Texas. That's not very many folks. The first courthouse was built in Boonville in 1852 by Harvey Mitchell. It was not an elaborate affair. It had one door, no windows, and the central heat and cooling came through the cracks in the logs. That was the first courthouse. A dirt floor, they didn't have to worry with cleaning the floor because it was always dirty. They used the, then then later on they, they expanded and built a much bigger log house and it was sort of the community center. It was the precursor of this building right here, but it wasn't near as big or as nice. And then later on, Harvey built that and then he came over and worked in Bryanton. Harvey has been called the, the uh, father of Brazos County. Some of you who are my age knew Judge uh, Stuart Barron. Judge Barron told me that the real father of Brazos County was Harvey Mitchell's older brother, Dr. Julius Paley Mitchell. He never told me why he said that, but you, you, most of you have heard of Stuart Barron. He was a prominent judge. He later became Speaker of the House of Representatives in Austin. Had lots of kinfolks, lots and lots of kinfolks. Now, I'm, I'm gonna turn this map around, and you can't see this, but Maybe some of you can recognize this green picture. If you've ever been to New York City, you know that's Central Park. And you think, well, old Sam Sharp has just lost all of his marbles. What in the world does Central Park have to do with Brazos County? Well, very little, but <laughs> Frederick Law Olmsted was, without a doubt, the most noted landscape man in the 1800s. He designed, primarily designed Central Park. He did the public gardens adjacent to Boston Common. He did all of the grounds right outside Asheville, North Carolina, where the Vanderbilts built the largest house in the United States. He actually worked on 30 public gardens throughout the country. And in 1852, he brought his younger brother down south to Texas because he thought it would increase the health of his brother. So he came across the northern tip of Brazos County. So we can claim Freddie Olmsted as our very own because he, he did all those wonderful landscape things. In 1860, the railroad came up from the south to Millican, Texas. And Millican was the boom town, the metropolis of Brazos County. We had Boonville, which had very few folks in it. You know where Boonville is because you go out to the Boonville Road and you see the cemetery on the left. I've tried for years to get the Brazos County Commissioner's Court to get a couple of A&M classes, maybe in architecture, maybe in archaeology or sociology, whatnot, to buy a couple of cheap Geiger counters and go out to Boonville and locate all the graves. 
and then mark it on a big plat and then sell at a very high price burial plots out there. They don't do a thing in the world but mow that grass and oak it one day a year. It is a waste of taxpayers' money. But my ideas are always in the minority. I'm a minority of one. But, uh, <laughs> I've sort of grown accustomed to it. I don't like it, but I, I've learned to live with it. But they hadn't done that yet. But, uh, now, in 1865, the war was over. And the next year, 1866, they began to extend the railroad, and they got up to Bryan, and they said, well, bye-bye, Boone, but we're going to move the courthouse to Bryan, Texas. And sure enough, they did. They finished the road, to, the railroad, to, to Bryan in 1866, and the next year was a terrible year for Milligan. Twin disasters struck. They had a yellow fever epidemic, and many, many people died. And the railroad was in Bryan, and all those folks not all, but most of them decided to move to Bryan. There was a shortage of building materials in Bryan. No Home Depot, no Lowe's. <laughs> they actually tore down homes and stores in Millican and transported the lumber to Bryan to build more stores and homes up there. <clears throat> Millican just withered away. Uh, there are lots of names that associate with Millican that moved to Bryan. The Haswell brothers. I'm too young to know the Haswell story, Brian. The Haswell store is downtown on the northeast corner of 25th and Main Street. And if you wanted a nice wedding present in the 20s and 30s and 40s, you went to Haswell's to buy it. There were two brothers, and one of them had a daughter named Era, A-R-A, and she's just crazy as hell. <laughs> Era had flaming red hair and lots of it, and she went to Hollywood and became a star. She had one walk-on part, no words, and she told everybody she was a Hollywood star. Well, she later came back and lived in one of the nice residential hotels in Dallas, and she belongs to my little church, St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, and we have her correspondence with the senior warden. She wanted to do a fountain in memory of the Haswell boys. Well, it went back and forth. She never did anything but talk about it, but she was something else, and uh, I won't tell you about her son because we're in mixed company, but anyway... The Hazels were a very prominent family. In 1870, only half of Texas was actually settled at all. In 1871, Bryan appointed a committee of three people to try to get the Texas A&M College to locate in Brazos County. Harvey Mitchell was among those three, and there were two other men. And they were to go to Houston, where you might say they were having tryouts. Everybody wanted the college. San Antonio wanted it, Waxahachie wanted it, you name it. Everybody wanted the college. One of the men didn't even go to Houston. And Harvey and the other one went down there. And when they got to Houston, the second man, he said, well, he said, I think I'll just go on to Galveston and have a good time and party. So they left Harvey by himself to present the case of Brazos County to these folks from Austin. He talked and talked and talked, and they finally told Harvey, said, okay, we'll let you have it if you'll give us a deed in 48 hours to 2,250 acres of land in Brazos County. So Harvey wired the man and, and Brian, got no response, got on the train, came back up here, worked, 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 night and day, got the deeds, went back to Houston, delivered it, and that's why we have Texas A&M today. Now, why do we have it where it is? Who knows why it's right over here rather than there or somewhere else? Because they didn't want to have it too close to that, that den of iniquity known as Brian, but they needed some saloons close by because the college needed places to have saloons. The boys needed places to go to for saloons. I think he made a hundred A+. Plus. <laughs> Brian was the den of iniquity. There were more saloons than you could count. And in 1874, the Bryan City Council had many, many meetings trying to figure out whether or not they wanted to pass ordinances that would govern body houses. Now, I don't know what a body house is, but it sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Bryan had cockfighting and horse racing and gambling. And, and those saloons, there's everywhere, you know. I'm never far from a bar. I love to drink. Cheers. <laughs> In 1879, 
the grand jury in Brazos County issued 80 indictments for illegal gambling. So it was a very active industry, even though it wasn't legal. 1880 was a fun year because that's when the Immigration Society was formed. There were all kinds of folks streaming into Brazos County. A lot of those folks, as you all know, came from Italy, primarily from Sicily. There were so many Italians coming over here and going back to visit the kinfolks for weddings and funerals and whatever that an Italian steamship company established a full-time office in Bryan, Texas. And that's beyond my comprehension. 1880, you know, full-time Italian steamship company. But evidently they did a lot of business. Now, this, this immigration society was founded and the folks were streaming into Galveston, Texas from, from everywhere, not just Italy. And the St. Joseph Catholic Church priest in Bryan, Texas, <laughs> made many a trip to Galveston to welcome these people. There were no food stamp programs. There were no federally subsidized housing. The father went down there and met those people and welcomed them and took them back to Bryan and made sure they had a place to live and food to eat. Now that's, that's real philanthropy. That, that's a wonderful thing to have done. In 1884, Peter and Anna Dominic, good Polish folks, traveled overland with their five children to Hamburg, Germany. They took a ship to New York, and when they got there, they got off with their five kids and one piece of luggage. Now, most of you can't go to Dallas or Houston for a day with one piece of luggage, <laughs> but here were Peter and Anna, five little kids and one piece of luggage. You know, just beyond. Peter worked for 17 long years as a farm laborer, and he saved his money now, how many young folks today would work for 17 years and save their money? Very, very few. But he did this, and at the end of that 17 years, he bought 420 acres of land in, in what is now College Station, Texas. And the only thing that reminds us physically of the Dominic family is the street that Cecil Culpepper named Dominic. And th th we should have all kinds of plaques and things, because this was a remarkable family, but th that's, about, that's about it. Now, let's talk about some of the folks that really made Brazos County. In 1797, a man named Sam Parker was born in Virginia. He moved to Tennessee. He was a bookkeeper and a farmer and, and just did all kinds of things. Saved his money, decided he'd take his five sons and one daughter to Texas. He got as far as Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and his wife died. He came on, went to Burleson County, bought some land, did well, and had all those kids. He married uh, Eliza R. Montgomery, who was Harvey Mitchell's sister. And about two years later, he died, and Eliza raised all those children and did a good job of it. The, about the oldest child was Mitt Parker. And I have various sources that tell me how many acres of land that Mitt Parker farmed in the Brazos Bottom. 7,000, 7,200, 7,600. He had a bunch of land. We don't really care exact number of acres. Most of it, 75% or so, was in cotton. The rest of it was in grain crops. He did very, very well. He established a bank in Millican, Texas, before the twin disasters struck with a Mr. Flippin, who later on went to Dallas and had a bank. And then he came to, 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 uh, to Bryan, and he was really the only one of the Parker kids who, who lived in Bryan at that time. He had a son named Mitt Parker, and the old Parker house is going strong as the bed and breakfast over in West Bryan. Let's see, it was Sam and Mitt and Mitt, and he had two girls. Margaret had no children, and Kate married Bob Bernath, and many of you knew, and they had no children. But the Parker family was large. Uh, the middle Mitt, Mitt's, Mitt's son, had sort of a brother in the, in the guise of Jack Gordon. Jack Gordon was born and his mother was in ill health and she went to Mrs. Parker and said, I want you to take my boy and raise him. So he was about the same age as, as young Mitt and they were raised as brothers and they thought they were brothers. And Mr. Mr. Gordon married one of the Johnson girls from, from San Angelo. Now the Johnsons were not on food stamps even before oil and gas came. They had lots of cows and lots of sheep and lots of land and lots of stock in the Central National Bank. And he married, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gordon married Ruth Johnson, brought her back here, and they had one girl, Ruth 
Gordon McGill, and she had a girl, Ruth. There was Big Ruth, Middle Ruth, and Little Ruth, but they had, they had lots of Ruths. Dutch Elmendorf and I went doing canvas calls for the church 20, 30 years ago. We went to see Miss Gordon, very gracious, attractive lady, and she said, well, you know, if I tithed, nobody else in the church would have to give anything. I encouraged her to tithe, but she didn't do it. <laughs> This map will show you up about right here. There's something that says Higgs SH. That was the Higgs schoolhouse. Thomas Higgs lived in an oversized log structure that was a combination home and fort for that part of the country. Today, you can locate that area by going up the highway to the North Bryan Athletic Complex, the Moses Bain League. Thomas had a son named Walter, and Walter had a son named W.S. Higgs. I came to work at the First State Bank and Trust Company in August of 1962, and Uncle Will Higgs was the chairman of the board. Uncle Will had three girls. He had Margaret, who married Frank Stevens, and went to Waco. Catherine married Louis Fisto, no children. And Ida Bell, the oldest girl, married Vern Adams. And you know who Vern Adams was. He was a band man at A&M for years and years and years. They had a son named Ed, who's passed away, and he had a son named, named Rusty Adams that practiced law, and he is the great, great grandson of Uncle Will. Now, Uncle Will had a sister named Bertha Higgs, and she married Will McCullough. They had two girls, Esther McCullough Dansby and Pauline McCullough Grant. Richard Grant, his son-in-law, tells me that during the 30s that Will McCullough ran an ad every day in the classified section of the Brown Daily Eagle which simply said, before you buy, sell, or trade, see me, Will McCullough, with a telephone number. Mr. McCullough was a real trader. He had lots and lots of land. They had the Higgs land. He had added to it. And, and, and old Bob Armstrong tells me that when Mr. McCullough died, his will was the back of an envelope, a used envelope. He wouldn't dare use a new one, cost too much. <laughs> and, and, and in pencil, Mr. McCullough said that Pauline gets all the land east of this highway and Esther gets all the land west of the highway. And Bob Armstrong, the lawyer, managed to probate that piece of envelope as the will of Mr. McCullough. Uh, you go downtown today, if you have good eyes, better than mine, you can see McCullough Dansby on the corner of Time Antique Place there. It used to be a furniture store with Mr. McCullough and his son-in-law, Mitt Dansby. And Mitt Dansby was more fun than anybody in the county. He, he lived it up all day, every day. He went off to A&M, and he went home to eat Thanksgiving lunch with his mama, who was Minnie Morgan Dansby. And Mrs. Dansby said, well, son, are you reading your Bible? He said, oh, yes, ma'am, I read it every day. Well, Mrs. Dansby had put a $50 bill in the Bible. <laughs> and, and Mitt probably had never seen a $50 bill in his entire life. He never opened the Bible. But anyway, Mitt lived it up. Uh, Mitt, I could tell you stories about Mitt Dansby for two days, but you wouldn't believe half of them anyway. But Esther married Mitt, and they had no children. And Pauline married Richard Grant, the doctor. And they had two girls. And uh, Esther, Jane, Grant... McDougall lives here with Fane, and, and Janie is very active in all kinds of things, and Polly lives in Denton. And uh, the Higgs family were just worlds and worlds of folks, not as many as the Henrys, but uh, now we go across the street, downtown Bryan, from, from the Haswell building, <clears throat> and on the corner would be the, uh, the southeast corner was Edge's store. About three Edge brothers came from Georgia right after the Civil War, and then they, they settled in northeast Brazos County, and naturally they, they had a little community which they named Edge. They were all very, very hardworking, successful people. Eugene Edge had that on, on the corner store, and he said, Edge is on the corner. And in the middle of that block, he had two cousins, and they called that Edges in the middle. <laughs> One of the Edge boys and his wife founded the Free Will Baptist Church. Uh, old Eugene Edge was, was just a miser, just, just a real honest-to-goodness genuine Scrooge. He also owned the, the Bryan Traction Company, the interurban thing. And he, he just, he built, the, there were three big red brick houses built in Bryan in the mid-20s. The Aston Boys built two of them and Eugene Edge built one. 
where Pat and Ed Heiler lived in recent years until just a few months ago. He contracted that and did all the contracting himself. And one day he got on the train and went to Chicago overnight, jumped off the train, went to Marshall Fields, bought the furniture for the entire house, got back on the train and came to Bryan. Now, Eugene married a girl named Cora Zuch. And for a wedding present, her daddy, Julius Zuch, gave him that building for a wedding present. Julius Zuch came to Galveston, 1841-42. I wasn't there, and I'm confused about the year. But he, tr he didn't speak a word of English, but he learned it quickly, and he worked for a wholesale hardware company in Galveston. He traveled throughout a large portion of Texas selling wholesale hardware. And he, he came through the area which we know is Zooch and North Zooch and liked the dirt, bought some, came back, bought some more, finally came back to it and lived. And he did everything you could do in a rural agrarian economy. He, you could say he had a farm and a ranch, he had a grist mill, he had a cotton gin, he had a store, built a lovely house in the area called Willowhole. Willowhole, so they say, was the place where the Indians used to meet. They have a circle of stones where they had fires. And, and somehow or other, a lot of folks from, from the southeast of the United States would come through Willow Hole. They had heard of it. But you, Julius was, was very, very successful. I, I called his great-grandson, Eugene Edge. I wanted to borrow his cane and, and bring it and show it to you. It's a heavy, black, very ebony black cane with a real gold top on it. It's, it's not 14 karat gold, it's, it's real gold. It's about this high, but I couldn't get Eugene. I don't, he, want, he probably didn't want to answer the phone. He's, he's tired oftentimes. But Julius had a bunch of kids. He had one named Cora that married Eugene Edge. He had one named Martha, they called her Mitty, and she married old Dr. Searcy's daddy, Roland Searcy's grandmother. I have a letter, uh, it's in some fair condition, from one of the Zeus boys who went off to college, he was writing to mother and the sisters back in Zeus, and it was dated 1877, and he had gone off to college to A&M. And he wrote, I wrote, I gave this to A&M to, to you for some kind of celebration, they gave it back to me, but off to school one year after A&M was founded. Uh, another one of the Zeus's was, was Mabel Zimmerman. She, she lived in the house on North Washington, which is about a block and a half in the courthouse, one story, wooden Victorian house, now it's a law office. Pearl Winters and her husband did the Winters edition to the city of Bryan. She was another Zeus girl. Sue Sanders Lowe, who taught art in the Bryan School for years and years and years, mother was a Zeus girl. Uh, there were a bunch of them. <laughs> and they were all fun folks. <clears throat> we're gonna go back to Harvey Mitchell for a minute. Harvey Mitchell had a daughter, and they, they called her Jenny. She, she had a horrible name like Al Thrusi or something crazy, but they call, all called her Jenny. And Jenny fell in love with Harvey Mitchell's sister's son, first cousins. And the family says, you can't get married. This is, it's just not done. You can't marry your first cousin. Well, they were madly in love with each other, and, and the Johnsons lived a day's horse ride away from Brian. And to communicate, little Jenny and, and young Mr. Johnson would write letters and fold them up into little pieces of paper and go out to the hall tree and get Harvey's hat and do the hat band up and put the letters there. And he would go see his sister hanging on the hall and Mr. Johnson, young Mr. Johnson would get that, write a return and give it back. I call that the hat band romance. Now that's not in the books. <laughs> oh, three or four years ago, let's see now. Harvey had Jenny, and they finally relented and let Jenny marry Mr. Johnson. They had a child, and, and, he, and, and Mr. Johnson died shortly thereafter, and the child died of meningitis. H Harvey had a number of children, and I think four or five of them died of meningitis. But this Jenny remarried a Mr. Weddington, and they had a son named Dale Weddington. Dale was very popular during the Depression because he had a federal government job, and he could hire people. Nobody else much around here was hiring anybody, but Dale could. Dale had two girls, Ruth Petty and Louise Porter, so they would be Harvey Mitchell's great-granddaughters. Now, and, and Ruth married Marvin Porter, Boswell and Holland's brother. Now, what's sort of funny to me is that Harvey had another daughter named Frances, and her second name was like Barziza, B-A-R-Z-I-Z-I. -I. Now, where they got that, God only knows, I don't. But Francis married Elihu Nash from Waco. 
and they had a child and then they had the Nash Hardware Company in Waco and Ruth Nash married Boswell Porter. She was also a great granddaughter of Harlan Mitchell. Ruth, Ruth's mother was a Higginbotham and they were kin to all the Higginbothams in Dallas, the Higginbotham Pearl Stone, the Higginbotham Bailey, the Higginbotham Lumber Yards, on and on and on. So they go back to the Higginbotham reunions and, and visit with those folks all the time. Now let's go up north for a few minutes. We, it won't be, we go to Calvert. Calvert had the largest cotton gin, not just in Robertson County, not just in the state of Texas, not just in the United States, but in the world around 1900. The Gibson family gin was the largest cotton gin in the world. Now that's, you know, you talk about superlatives and Texas brags, that, that was the real, real deal. I could talk to you about the Gibson, especially old funny Joe Gibson for a long time, won't do that either. Uh, Calvert had the second largest Jewish population in the state between 1875 and 1900. The largest was in Galveston. They, they were, had the most successful and, and the largest Jewish population. Now we go east a little bit to Huntsville. Can you all hear me if I talk over here? Yeah. Sort of? Okay. Back to the machines. In 1841, Thomas Gibbs came to Huntsville and he established a store right across the street from the courthouse, a corner building still owned by the Gibbs folks. He and his brother did well in the store and they started buying land and they bought land in a number of counties, not three or four, but a bunch of counties. They established the Gibbs Brothers Partnership, which is generally acceded to be the oldest continuously operating business in the state of Texas. Now, I never married a Gibbs, God knows I would have if I'd known anybody, but <laughs> if they say when you marry a Gibbs, you sign an agreement <clears throat> which says if the Gibbs person you marry dies and you get that whole estate, you can't sell the Gibbs interest except for book value. And book value is infinitesimally small and the market value is huge. Back in maybe 64, 5, or 6, the Gibbs boys sold some land to Louisiana Pacific or Champion, one of these big paper companies, and it was for an eight-figure sum of money, like 10, 20, 20 million dollars, bunch of money. These Gibbs people used to have the Gibbs National Bank. They rebaptized it, now it's the first national bank. But the Gibbs partner, and they're still in that building, it's not a store anymore, upstairs has these old, original 1840s, 50s, and 60s, handwritten records. Just a, it's just a fantastic museum in that business up there. But, but the Gibbs brothers, are, and there's a book that came out about four or five years ago about the Gibbs brothers. <clears throat> I told you we had three big red brick houses. Irvin Aston built one, which is the McDonald's and Bryan, just gone. Eugene Edge is still there, and the prettiest one, the finest architecture, the best materials, is the Roger Aston house. When he was engaged to marry Nina Hurd from McKinney, several of the old girls in Bryan said, well, she's just marrying him for his money. And then somebody said, you don't know what you're talking about. The Hurds have more money than the Astons have, <clears throat> which was probably true. Mr. Hurd did all kinds of things to get money, and they, they gave the, the city of McKinney the Hurd Museum. Uh, <clears throat> Nina Hurd Aston had two children. John died at an early age, and then Nina Aston Winkler predeceased her mother. But this is getting into philanthropy. Currently, today, we have, we, the city, the people of Brazos County, have two Aston Trusts. And, and they've done wonderful things for Brazos County through the years. There, we're talking a little bit now about philanthropy. I read just the other day about Aunt Gussie Wilburn, a charming college station black lady who took in over 50 children during her lifetime. And she might keep them for two years or she might keep them for 10 or 12 years. The children needed a home, and she provided the love and the home, the food, the nurture. And then later on, she took in 25 older people who had no place to go, and she gave them a home. Uh, now, th this lady is, is, to me, just about the best philanthropist in, in Brazos County, Texas. Now, she was, she was recognized in 1985, and she was 
probably older than I am now. I don't think she's still with us, but, but she was a lovely, lovely lady. Now, we go back to philanthropy, to the Catholic priest going down and taking these people, giving them a place to stay, food to eat, getting them started. That was philanthropy. <clears throat> I call the, uh, the two banks. The Wells Fargo Bank has about $20 million in charitable trust. The First National Bank has about $6 million in charitable trust. <laughs> to my knowledge, the only other bank in the county that has trust powers is First Victoria, and their trusts are all in the Victoria area because they're a brand new entity, so to speak, in Brazos County. In 1889, a man named Manuel Rodriguez came to Bryan, and he had a big sombrero, and he would walk up and down Main Street, and he fascinated the children. Now, he did all kinds of odd jobs till he could get enough money to start a little restaurant. And this book has a couple of references to him about his restaurant. Today, and that's a long time ago, today he has a son named Pete L. Rodriguez, who's just an absolutely charming gentleman. Pete worked for years and years at A&M in the chemistry department. If you wanted something done in the chemistry department, Pete did it just like that. He was the den mother. If you wanted an employee, if you wanted a supply, furniture, you wanted to change the hour or something, Pete was the one that did it. Pete and I worked on two or three civic charitable things in the 60s, and now he's, he is a trustee in the Brazos Community Foundation. Now, what is the Brazos Community Foundation? Goodness gracious, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> the first community foundation in the United States or the world was founded in Cleveland about 1914. I've met people from the Netherlands, Germany, Mexico, Canada, many places where there, where there are community foundations today. The folks at the Dayton Community Foundation came up with a definition because nobody really knew what a community foundation was. And they said something like, a community foundation is a collaborative effort of diverse interest organized for permanence in a specifically defined geographic area which tends to nurture individual donors, 501c3 groups, and the community at large to strengthen the community. And that's the definition of it. About three years ago in July, the Brazos Community Foundation got its 501c3 letter from the federal government saying, okay, you're, you're tax exempt, go get them. And today it has in assets, three years later, about 700 and, and uh, in excess of $750,000. We've got a $10,000 check coming in later this week and folks talk to us all the time. <clears throat> now, what, how does this money work? What does it do? The money is invested in permanent endowments that go on forever and ever and ever, beyond infinity. You can't see the end of it. And the, the capital remains and it grows and, and, and annual distributions are made. The fastest growing facet of philanthropy today in the United States is a donor advised fund. Kitty and Will Worley come to the Bradley Community Foundation and say, here's some money, we want to start the, the Will and Kitty Fund. And once a year, the community foundation would say, Kitty, where do you want this money to go this year, girl? And she said, well, let me talk to Will. And they called back in a couple of days and said, well, we want it to go to the Boys and Girls Club. And I said, super, we'll do that. We have a whole list of funds. I'm not going to read them to you, if you care to come look at it. The Boys and Girls Club, Scotty's House, the Children's Museum, the Children Museum of Natural History, the Brazos Valley Corral, the, Bra the Brazos Symphony, Hospice, Habitat, the Steel Creek Ranch, on and on and on. All these wonderful things that you know and probably support. Now, this map is probably, I mean, nobody knows how old it is. I've had people guess and they say they think it's around 1910 or 1914 World War I. I have some old copies of that map. If you like old maps, it's got, it's got little communities on there that have evaporated in, into the atmosphere. If you want a copy of that map, I can sell you one today for 50 or more dollars and you can make the check to the Brazos Community Foundation. And if you don't say where it goes, it'll go to unrestricted. If you want to put it in any one of these funds, it'll be added to that or you can start your own fund today. But this is, this is a wonderful opportunity for you and don't leave without buying one. Back to philanthropy in general. Uh, the Houston Endowment is the biggest, not community foundation, but charitable trust in the state of Texas. 
Oh, a few years back, they had slightly over one and one half billion dollars. Probably, in my opinion, which is very warped, the most active and best foundation in Texas is the Meadows Foundation in Dallas. Al Graham, Virginia Meadows, did all business all over the world, had no children. The Meadows Foundation has done more things for more entities in Brazos County than I know of that. For about four years, I have, I have begged Linda Evans, the president of the Meadows Foundation, to come to Bryan. I said, we'll put you up in the LaSalle Hotel downtown. We'll give you a tour. We'll take you to every charitable entity in the county to which you've given money, and they can say thank you to them. We'll have a Meadows Thank You Day. Oh, she says, we, 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 just, we have so many trustees. We, I said, just bring one. Bring two. You come with your secretary. We want to say thank you to the Meadows Foundation. Now, Scotty's house is going to give them a, a full court press soon for their new building. Uh, they've helped hospice, they've helped habitat, they've just all known and on what they've done. And I don't know half of what they've done. But the Meadows Foundation is a wonderful thing for the state of Texas. And when you ask the Meadows Foundation for money, they don't give you 15 pages to fill out. They say, write us a letter, tell us how much money you want and what you're going to do with it. Now what could be easier than that? And they just do all kinds of marvelous things. Uh, now I've got seven minutes left before my time's up. Does anybody want to ask a question? I probably won't be able to answer, but I'll make up one. <laughs> that looks like Dan Fansteel, and he wants to give $1,000 to the Brad's Community Foundation. <laughs> Yay, Dan! A hundred thousand. Oh well. Well, we can, we can't do that on Wednesday. I can come see you tomorrow. Okay. I've heard from other sources in the A and M History Department that uh, Harvey Mitchell was not totally beloved among his citizens because he was regarded as a scalawag at the time. Is there any basis for that? I I have no idea. I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, does anybody know what I mean by scalawag? When, when Ruth Petey went to Dallas three or four years ago to be near one of her daughters. She called me and she and I had taught Brazos County history through the years and she said, come see me. So I went to see Ruth and she had a big box of Harvey Mitchell papers, most of which were in his handwriting. And, and she said, I want to give them to you. I said, I will take them home, read every word of them, make copies of some of them, and then I'll give them to the Carnegie Library so everybody can enjoy those papers. And there are all kinds of things in there, as I said, in Harvey's handwriting. But I don't think it's, any of them are going to say, I was a Scalloway <laughs> signing Harvey Mitchell. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I keep getting um, requests, obviously, as all of us do, for a bunch of things, but also for police department things and firemen things around Texas. And is there such a thing as a, as a sheet of paper or a book that would allow us to know what we can do for our own community? I mean, I just assume give something that would make a difference to the firemen and groups here and the police here or the puppy patrols here, if that's, you know. Is there such a thing that we have that would allow us, uh, however small our donations, I mean, to, to, to know how we help our Bryan College Station and the Rogers County community? I don't know of a paper like that. There, there are two or three things that are sort of close to it, but Rustlene, answer her question. The only thing I know about is something the Convention and Business Bureau puts out every year, but it's pretty limited. The, it, would that be something that someone might will, be willing to consider? Because well, what, what a good way to return to your community. I know I've, over the years I've heard people say that. I think you should do it. <laughs> now that's a good idea, but I, I don't. The Chamber of Commerce has a list of, of organizations per se in the county, but well, but it's not what you're talking I know about. That I can get an Albertson type, a card that I can take to Albertson that will give back to the fire department because I finally went to them and said, how can I give to you instead of giving to this, you know, this the statewide whatever it is. So at least I got that little thing, but I'm not even sure we have a system. Uh, and I was checking with the police. I, I don't know. Perhaps uh, I, 
I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to do it because I'm trying to do other things. Well, see, you, you can start a fund with the Brothers Community Foundation to benefit the fire department. <laughs> and, and, and we can get that started this afternoon. Don't run off. I think Parker Aston Hardware was started about 1911. Uh, and I don't know which Parker it was or which Aston. Both those two families were, were, were large stockholders in the old Merchants and Planners Bank, which became the City National Bank, and it's been reincarnated three or four times to be Wells Fargo today. Uh, and now the, the wealth, and I think the store has been bought by Zane Anderson and one other man whose name I've forgotten. Uh, but, I don't know which, which one of those Astons and Parkers that was. <coughs> Catherine Parker Chatham married Roland Chatham. <coughs> Park, Catherine was, was in, the, in the wax during the war. war. <coughs> she has done a genealogical chart of the Parker family from, from Sam back in 1797, and I looked for mine last night. Uh, some of the descendants are uh, Francis Chance James, was the mother of Jim James and Francis Kimbrough. And Jim James had a son named Jim James. He was a local attorney. And Francis Kimbrough had a girl, girl named Francis Kimbrough. They had no imagination with names. <laughs> and she's a local psychologist. Uh, you'll see the James name on the drugstore downtown on the corner of Bryan and 26th Street. Uh, she was Francis Chance James was a Parker X generations back. Uh, you, you can hear stories about Pat Ch Chance Thomason, mother, grandmother, had an old Cadillac convertible, a four-door Cadillac convertible back in the 20s and early 30s. And Mrs. Chance would wash her hair. Now, they lived in the great big white house across the corner from St. Andrew's Church, great big white mansion, you can, you can call it uh, Beau Arts, uh, traditional southern plantation, great big white house. She'd wash her hair, get in that convertible, and ride up and down Main Street, way beyond the city limits to dry her hair. And when she went to the grocery store, she got in that fancy car and got in front of the grocery store and blew the horn until somebody came out to take her order. She was not a shy lady. She lived it up. Beg pardon? Ask him his definition of a well, you, you can do that from up there. Well, you tell us about it. <laughs> well, everybody knows what a carpet factor was. These were people from the north who cooperated with the Federal Occupation Forces after the Civil War. Scalawags were locals who cooperated with the Yankees uh, and were therefore sometimes not universally loved. Right. Those who had southern sympathy. You can go view Gone with the Wind again. Uh, Scalawag was, was the overseer, Tara. Right. Yeah. Local cooperation. Well, go and sin no more. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> oh, one other brief thing I forgot to tell you. Very important. I was going to go down and get three of these books from the library. You can buy this book for $50 at the Bryan Public Library. At the sesquicentennial time, 18, 1986, the Texas State Historical Association asked each of Texas 254 counties to write a county history. A number of people worked on this book and it won first prize. And there's a limited edition of a thousand of these things, there are some left. But it, it, just ha it has more information about Brazos County than you ever dreamed existed. So go down there and buy one of it, and you make your check to Friends of the Library, and it goes on and on and on to help the library do things. Thank you.